I love the story. The story was absolutely incredible, but potatoes, I just can't handle it. So, and see, yeah. I would have just read right over that. So you want to write about the tutors, huh? You want to write about the time of the tutors. Well, I've got a great guest on today, Janet Wertman, and she's going to discuss tutors, do's, don'ts, and her experiences. Hi, I'm Autumn Mardeau, and this writing channel is all about author tips and writing tricks, and really living your best writing life, because let's face it, most of us are doing other things while we're trying to live our writing dream, right? We're working full time or we have children or we're doing caretaking or a million other things. So this is a space that I've created for writers like myself who just need a lot of information fast and in short little nuggets so we can figure out how we can live our dream while also living our life. If you would like to join our writing community, make sure you tap that subscribe button and then that notify button because then it will kind of go into your YouTube feed stuff. And also if you like this kind of conflict, I would just love it if you would give it a big old thumbs up. And of course, comments, love comments. It took me a lot of years to find a way to reconcile my love for writing, my passion for writing, and then sharing it with others in a way that gave me peace and not feel like I was running on some kind of treadmill and trying to get everything out fast and trying to get all this information. So that's what I'm doing with you, kind of sharing my journey, my experience, so that, you know, you can live your best writing life. Hi everyone, we're going to talk about tutor time. It's all tutor talk today. And I have the fabulous Janet Workman with me. Janet and I have been friends for a couple years now. We've, we've done Zooms together probably once a week. And she is, she's all things tutor. She loves the tutor, eats, breathes, and lives tutor. No, not so much, but <laughs> Janet, <laughs> Janet, could you give us a little quick bio? Tell us, you know, people who maybe don't know you, who you are and what you write. <laughs> you kind of caught me right there. I write about the tutors. <laughs> all tutor, all the time. I write historical fiction um, and all of the stuff that I don't have room for in my novels. I write a blog, again, Tutors. Um, I focused on the Seymour family because, um, so far, uh, because they really shaped the entire era. Now I'm moving even closer into Elizabeth for my next trilogy. It's, I'm still a ways away. Do you have your books handy for us to show? Okay. And the Queen, and then Path to Somerset, and Board King. So. Okay, are they in any particular order? Um, Jane the Queen is first, Path to Somerset takes us through Henry's crazy years, and then Boy King is Jane's son, but they are standalone. They can be read out of order, but there are some kind of fun things that you'll notice in later books if you've read um, the first books. It's small things, I mean, just like, ah, I remember that, you know, but it, it's they can be read out of order. Okay, awesome, awesome. And they are available where? Everywhere. <laughs> Amazon, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, Apple, Google, your local independent bookstore. <laughs> okay, awesome. And I think you said you're easy you're even working on large print, correct? Yes, that is that is going to be next libraries too. I should have mentioned libraries. Oh, okay. Too. And if they're not in your library, request them. Nothing makes an author happier than having people request their books for different libraries. So it really does. It really does. Okay. So I, what I asked you on for was to share some tutor tips um, to writers who would like to write um, in the tutor times. And I think I got this idea when you were at a LA um, bookstore. What was the name of it? The book, the book Jewel. The Book Jewel. And you had a, um, a lovely young woman come up 
And she said, I would like to write a book. And I thought, oh, <laughs> you could <laughs> right, here's your person for a tutor. And I think that's kind of gave me the idea to do this. And then of course you love the idea. So we were like, yay, we'll do this together. So what could be a tip that you would give writers who are thinking of writing a book in the tutor times? Do it. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, that really is, um, no matter how you do it, just do it. Um, and a lot of people think that they need to write about a well-known tutor personality. And actually, you can write a whole bunch of things and just stick it in the era. So you have like CJ Sampson, who has um, an entire uh, series of mysteries using somebody set in the Tudor era. You have uh, another woman who wrote about, um, uh, Nancy Billio, who wrote about a young nun going through the dissolution of the monasteries. And I mean, it's just stick it in the era. If, if it interests you, it can absolutely be done and don't be shy about doing it. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff to be written about the era. Plus, plus the well-known figures. Do you think it's easier to write about a well-known figure, um, which I think would have its own issues, or about just a fictional character in the times? Um, I love writing about known people. Um, that is, That does come with its own constraints in that you really have to be careful. Once we know about them, we also know the basic things like where they were on what day. And you have to stay very true to that. If you make someone up entirely, you have the benefit of just, they can be anywhere. Um, although you do have to, in that case, figure out the story that you want to tell. Are you telling a mystery? Are you telling a whatever, whatever it is, or romance? There's uh, always room for romance. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I, I like a little bit of romance in, in all of it, just because, you know, that's life. Yeah, that's life. Okay, so um, can you give us another another? little hint about how we would write and tutor? The, the big thing is all about the research and about well, most important kind of balancing the way you write your characters with um, who we expect them to be now. So, and, and what I mean by that is, is that it is really hard to walk the tightrope between the historical fact and the way we see people today. And one of the really hard things is that um, women did not have the same kind of agency back then as they do now. Back in the Tudor era, you had a lot of women who were doing stuff in their husband's name. Okay. So uh, a lot of the wives made sure that the bills were paid and they followed up with a lot of the storefronts and they did a lot of the business, even though technically it was the husband that was doing any everything. So you can create situations that are completely believable where women really are acting um, with the same kind of resolve as we would expect them to have today. Um, which, which is important because it's it's very frustrating when you read a book and the woman's just like, you know, hey, you want to shake them sometimes. And it's like, do something. <laughs> but you can't go too far in the other direction. So, you know, that is something to keep in mind. Well, and I think you've mentioned before that, you know, our we put on our 21st century reader lens, right? And we read books through that lens of historical fiction. And I think you discuss a really, an important, like a, we call it a hot topic, right? So there's history and, you know, we write historical fiction. So you've got both there. And how do you blend those in a way where you're not going to, you still have the historical aspect, but 21st century readers won't be put off, aggravated, or just like perhaps just don't understand culture, 
you know, um, not even just the culture, but the, the ethics, the morals of what was going on at that time? That is, um, you do have to keep them believable for the time. But it, as I said, it's a tightrope. <laughs> it is very difficult to do both at the same time. It is possible, though, um, if you choose your situations carefully and you don't just, you know, do something absolutely nuts. It is absolutely doable. Because I think if you go totally off the rails <laughs> with what your character would do, you're going to have tutor. I don't want to say fanatics, <laughs> tutor fans, um, be like, no, no. And you need to be accurate to your novel. The tutorverse knows the facts. So you really have to be careful <laughs> and get those right. And um, just basically supply your own explanation. That's what everybody's really looking for is to kind of explain the situations, the facts, and what could have happened um, with all of these stories. So it is. Is there, can you give an example from one of your, I'm thinking maybe Jean, uh, Jane the Queen or Quinn, or I don't know how you pronounce that. <laughs> is it Quinn or Queen? No, it, it's Queen. The reason it's spelled like that is because we have only one example of Jane ever writing anything. And it was when she was announcing the birth of her son, she wrote Jane the Queen, and this is how she spelled it. Ah, so. okay, that explains it. So do you have a, even an example from that book or others, it doesn't matter, where you had to figure out which way am I going with this? Is history, fiction, a merging of both? Of, um, I actually have the example from The Boy King. Okay. And it is a story that everyone knows that um, his dog got killed by somebody, by his uncle actually breaking in in the middle of the night to kidnap him. Doug gets killed. Now, the whole thing is, is that back in the Tudor times, people loved their dogs. Um, Henry VIII, the inventory after he died, he must have had like a hundred jeweled collars for his dogs. They, they were... We have dogs. dogs. Why don't our dogs have jeweled collars? <laughs> jeweled collars, I know. Incredibly expensive jeweled collars. They love their dogs. And to really get this across, I needed to um, put in a scene before then of Edward getting the dog. Okay. And because that can contextualize how important this little puppy was and also explains just, it, it reminds the reader just how upsetting this was. I mean, we all know that it must have been upsetting to see your dog die in front of you. But if you really want to bring someone into the moment, you also need to show the prior moment of just falling in love with the little dog and yeah. bringing him everywhere and having him dig up some flowers. Okay. <laughs> so that, that makes sense. You're, and you're often like foreshadowing really that that dog's going to be important to him. And then really the cruelty of the person who killed the dog. Exactly. Um, and I think, you know, Tudor or not, I think the biggest issue with historical fiction is walking that, that line between what we need to tell to a 21st century audience or reader, and then really what was going on in the minds of people. Not that we know. I mean, we have stuff written, of course, but I mean, to, to visualize this and how we're also willing to suspend our disbelief is I know, I mean, I know you watch a lot of um, TV and Netflix series that are historical fiction and I watch them and I'm always thinking, look at those beautiful teeth on those people <laughs> and those warriors who just came from a battle and nobody bashed their teeth in, they all have their teeth. And we know that in our head, but we're okay with it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One of the things I know you said you focus on is you've got like big picture, medium picture and small picture. Do you want to explain that to us? Yes. So 
Um, there's a ton of research that goes into any historical fiction, um, tutors especially. The big picture, the things like who was king, who was, or, it, you know, <laughs> that's an easy one. Right. Um, but, but who was on the ascendant? Who was advising the king? Who was the king listening to? Um, the things like, okay, who did they meet with? You know, in terms of the ambassadors, who were they friends with? All of those huge things. Then you get down to the medium picture, which was, well, okay, what were they wearing <laughs> at the time? And um, actually, the what were they wearing was just a little bit smaller. The locations, the what they're wearing, the kinds of things, what would they have been eating? Um, because all of this little... The, these small pieces make the narrative believable. So when you're sitting there and you're writing a scene, you, you don't want to have it, um, and this goes back to the question of agency, um, so many women just kind of had to sit there and wait for the news to come to them. So, which, which even when you were a queen or a king, you had to wait and a lot of the news would, would come to you. So you have to find stuff for them to be doing, <laughs> not sitting there and waiting. And, you know, you've got the hunting, the hawking, the dancing, um, the playing cards, but just like, so um, a little bit. Um, so that's kind of your, your big picture, what was going on that day. The, the medium picture, where were they? And then the smaller picture, okay, they were playing cards. What game were they playing? The dice? What were the dice made out of? I mean, it's, it's a tiny thing, but to just add the word, you know, she threw the ivory dice and it's like, boom, there you go. <laughs> but you have to check that or it could be wrong. I mean, you find out it's just, so that's what I mean that every scene has just a ton of layers in terms of the research. Now you've got, you've said something that there's a difference between Tudor and Elizabethan and it has something to do with potatoes. Yeah, I got into big trouble. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I got a three-star review on the day that Jane came out and for a mistake and I should have known better. So I had a scene that had to do a lot of things. It was getting Jane back with her sister. It was, she was pregnant and this was happening and that was happening. And I needed her to be eating a comfort food. So I just did a quick research thing about, um, you know, authentic Tudor recipes. And I found a Tudor recipe and it was potatoes. And I was like, mm, that, I would eat that. That is a comfort food. I like it is, you know, it was, I, I forget the name of the guy who wrote it, but it was literally a Tudor era cookbook. So I okay. figured I was fine. And um, the problem is, is that Tudor reflects the entire era. Most people think of Henry's reign as being Tudor, but it also covers Elizabeth. And so when I looked for a Tudor recipe, potatoes were not introduced to England until 20 years after the period I was writing about. And I should have known that. <laughs> so I, I very quickly um, changed it to a syrup of quince, which was a comfort food used back then for um, pregnant women. So, but yeah, day one, I, I got, I got hammered. They were like, oh, the, the story, the story was absolutely incredible, but potatoes, I just can't handle it. So, and see, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I would have just read right over that you can't you, I would have because I don't you know I don't know my Tudor history so it would have just been but the Tudorverse they know the, the Tudors the Tudorverse knew the Tudorverse um I had somebody else in um my third book they didn't ding me they still gave me five stars but I had mentioned that the tower was built by William the Conqueror and she pointed out that William the Conqueror had been inspired by Knut in, in the tower's design. And I didn't mention that. And I, that was 
something that could have been brought out. But, you know, again, that's that's what wow. the blog is for. <laughs> For the fact that, you know, I understand that, but I, I can't bog down the narrative with that, but I'll talk about it in my blog. That's, <laughs> yeah. And we're going to have a link to your website and a link to your blog in the description okay. box below. So, you know, you be sure to check that out. But man, that's a little scary, like, because sometimes you just, you can't put in every detail because like you said, it bogs down the narrative. Right. And um Wow. I, that's, that's very surprising. (laughs) So you, you mentioned the Tudor cookbook. What other sources do you use for your research or what do you find are the best sources? There are a ton. Um, I have, um, actually, if you sign up for my blog, I send you a list of my favorite resources. So we have, um, we are very lucky to have the collection of all of the letters and papers. They kept all of the documents, the council records, and um, they also grabbed copies of all of the ambassador's correspondence and um, deciphered them and filed that. And all of that is available online. There are tons of primary sources. There are secondary sources. And there are also just really some fun. I mean, I actually love the um, cookbook. That that's always a fun one. Um, I am. Oh, there are records of all of the state trials. Um, is one of the things. That, there are just tons of little things that you can find that add um, accuracy and just little stuff um, that that are fun to have. So if somebody wants to write in the Tudor era, because there is so much, a plethora of information, they need to do some some serious research. You really have to sit down and make sure you know um, exactly what was written with all of that, because because it is there and it's yeah. all checkable. And it's and yeah, and you need to and you need to dig in. Now, um, some of it's more reliable than others, <laughs> and you have to kind of weigh one against the other, because you will find situations where you get um, conflicting facts, okay, and then okay. you just get to choose. You get to choose, or like sometimes you just go, forget it, I'm not even writing that in. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pass that over. That's just not, yeah. And I think sometimes we have to make those decisions, Right. Because but here's um, I'm, I'm going to rip off of that, which is another really key point is that there are going to be those things that you want to include that you just say no one's going to believe that or that's just not going to work. So um, I, the other day I posted um, Thomas Cromwell's to do list. Um, And it was absolutely, one of the entries was um, money for provisions for wine and Lenten stuff. And I had people commenting going, stuff was not in use in that time. And it's like, the man wrote it. (laughs) The man wrote it on his to-do list. You can see that he did. The word was in use, but nobody's going to believe that it was necessarily. So avoid that. Avoid it. So I, I actually looked that up. I looked up Lenten and I thought, okay, that's Lent things that have it to do with Lent. And then let's see, I have it written down here. Stuff is a noun. I did etymology. I love looking at etymology early 14th century quilted material worn under chain mail from the old French estoffe quilted material furniture provisions Modern French from estoffer to equip or stock. And I thought, aha. So it's stuff that you stock or equip for Lent. Right. And I thought, that is very cool. I love the etymology because I think it gives us a lot more information. And like you said, there are words we didn't think were in use, like... Um, Oh, there's something on my TikTok I have, and I just for the life of me can't remember what it is now. Um, I have to look it up. Hold on. It's anyways. Anyways was actually in use, and is actually a real word. 
that was used hundreds of years ago. So I get you. But would yeah. I use <laughs> but would I use anyways in a novel? No, because I'm gonna get dinged. Exactly. They're, they're gonna assume that it that it wasn't right. And I had um a similar situation where it's not that people would have assumed it wasn't right, but I would have had to explain it too much. So after Henry VIII gets bet- finds out that his um, fifth wife has been cheating on him, he retires to Oatland's palace. And I wanted to stick him in, he was like just sitting there all by himself. And I wanted him to be in the Tudor equivalent of his bathrobe eating ice cream out of the tub. And the bathrobe, totally fine. I had that with the, the fur collar and everything, but the Tudor equivalent of ice cream out of the tub was whale blubber. (laughs) It would have taken so much to kind of explain to people, no, 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 this is what it was. It wasn't worth it. So I just had him eat stuff other than ice cream. (laughs) You know, sometimes it just, you, you have the answer and it just doesn't Work and, and really, and when we look at um, historical fiction, you know, movies and, and TV shows, they don't have to say what it is. They just show them relishing what's ever in the bowl. That's exactly right. That's, that's all you want is just just let mm-hmm. them be sitting there. But, but no, we you, have to... you, in a novel, you can't have them, you know, spooning their face with stuff. <laughs> no, we have to be specific. And we have so... to be more specific. Yeah. Okay, that's that's awesome. Okay, another thing you discuss is um, finding critique partners when you write tutors. You want to give us some information Ooh. about that? Yes, a lot of people think that they need to find other tutor files to be critique partners. And I'm going to tell you that really, no, you don't. Um, and I'm going to argue for the exact opposite that you want critique partners who are not tutor experts. You want to present your story to people who don't necessarily know what's coming to see whether you've done it right. So in The Boy King, for example, um, I had to tell the story through the eyes of a nine-year-old who was being manipulated So I needed my reader to understand that he was being manipulated, even though it was all coming through him. And I was very happy not to have people who were familiar with the story, because when they read that and they said, oh, God, he's being manipulated. It's like, okay, that worked. Similarly, when I gave him his dog, (laughs) The reaction was, oh, that humanizes him. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. And no one was sitting there as any tutor file would have been going, oh, my God, that's the dog. That's the dog. (laughs) Okay. So it's good to have people not know what's coming. Um, And also because just look for people who can help you with specific things, like um, the, the guy who writes science fiction he's a world builder and gives me some of my best comments about building the world and basically just saying, look, I I don't really see this. I, you know, where are they standing in the room? What does the room look like? And, and is focused on that. Um, The guy who wrote Russian spy novels uh, was really helpful with pacing for the path to Somerset and um, the romance writers were great during the garden scene of Jane the Queen. So <laughs> that was very helpful. And I think that is awesome advice because I think we need to get out of our genre because other genres, mystery, romance, all those genres that you mentioned, we pull elements out of them and, and are able to write a more impactful story. And so you did tell us that if you subscribe to your newsletter, you give them lots of your sources, right? Yeah, I yes. Okay, so I have a couple questions for you. Okay, how much tutor detail is enough? I mean, you mentioned clothes, but like textiles, food, furnishings, descriptions of castles. And how do you like to integrate those details? 
without, of course, bogging the story down? Um, I typically start off, this is kind of like the rule for historical fiction that doesn't exist in regular fiction, where you start a scene with the setting so that people know exactly where they are. That's the place for it. And the details, I think you've done videos on this, the details that you pick about the castle are relevant to the specific scene. So, you know, the fact that the tower has white stone, it's interesting, <laughs> but if, if it's interesting that it's, you know, the white contrasting with all of the stuff that's going on underneath, the, you know, that's when it gets interesting. So, so pick the details for the reason that it's there. Is it, you know, a sumptuous gown? Sometimes, well, okay, the Tudorverse does like the gowns. <laughs> <laughs> you can never go wrong with the gowns. But, you know, how many times can you describe a gown other than, the, you know, to make the point of the jewels that were attached to it and um, why they were here versus there. Like Elizabeth um, had this thing about wearing Mary Queen of Scots's pearls, okay. especially after Mary died. And, you know, that was like Elizabeth's favorite piece of jewelry was mm -hmm. the, this incredible, it was a gorgeous robe of pearls, I have to say, but, but still. And so that becomes important to the story when you tie it back in. I, I think the details, as you said, if you if they do something, if they are adding to the emotion, the conflict, if the setting is showing um, something about character, then it works as this seamless integration. But, in, but detail for detail's sake. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a few more questions for you that I know you're, you're gonna love. <laughs> Okay. So do you, for people who want to write that Tudor novel, do you suggest writing the, the, the whole life of a character or a snippet of life and why? Snippet. That's the easy answer. And um, because right where the story is, because the story doesn't necessarily exist over the whole life. Um, you know, like, like Jane Seymour with, with Jane the Queen, we really don't know, need to know all of the stuff that happened before. Um, it was just, it doesn't really matter. What, what matters is right before when she met Henry and that part of her life. It, it's, it's, you write where the story is and all the rest of the stuff just has to leave. Has to leave. Mm -hmm. Very few people are that fascinating through their life. <laughs> well, well, okay. Elizabeth is, <laughs> she's my current trilogy, but even then I started it at a very specific point and I break it up based on there. There are very different themes and very different stories for each of the books. And, and that's really the, the way it's broken up. You've got in her youth where she's desperately trying to survive and make it to the throne. You've got the first few years of her being on the throne where it was all about love and marriage and her decision to remain single throughout her life. And then the book three is where she realizes she can no longer use the promise of marriage to cement alliances. That was a, a really, you know, that was a pair of aces in any deck of cards. And what does that look like? And that is about creating her legacy. And it is in those years where she really becomes Gloriana. So it, very different books, very different stories. I, I would not, it would not be the same if the books were all together. Because okay. it is, you know, I've, I've stopped it at, at discrete points for that. What are the best shows, TV shows, Netflix, whatever, for getting the Tudor aesthetic or the language or just feeling that as Tudor vibe? Which are the best to watch? They all have their own issues, I know, but... <laughs> 
they've all got their own issues. For me, I the the first um, tutor series that I saw was The Six Wives of Henry VIII and then Elizabeth R. from the 1970s. And those are still, um, in terms of accuracy, in terms, you can trust that. And it's just amazing. The actors, um, Keith Mitchell as Henry, Glenda Jackson as Elizabeth, it's amazing. Um, the tutors, if you're younger than I am and you want something just a little bit more racy, but don't expect accuracy with the tutors, um, they really focused on excitement. They never let Jonathan Reese Myers get fat or old. Um, they decided that people would just have, oh, it's too hard to remember that he's got two sisters. So they conflated <laughs> the sisters into a single one. I mean, they, 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 took, they took some liberties, let's put it that way. But in terms of drawing you in, um, it is really good for that. Wolf Hall is another one. It's the, the shows are, are good. They've, they've all got their drawbacks, but it's a lot of fun. Wolf Hall is a show? Wolf Hall, yes, they made um, they made a show. I'm gonna have to look that up. There was when when it premiered in um, the around the world. Actually, there was um, a drinking game on Twitter, where every time um, uh, one of the characters says, um, "Call me Risley," you say you were supposed to drink because it literally happened. <laughs> <laughs> Every five minutes, call me Risley. It's like, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like that. That could that could be a fun watch. Then. <laughs> yes. Okay, and now I've got a question, and you have not seen this coming, so I don't know if you're going to be prepared for it. Okay, so if you could go back in time and be any tutor you wanted. Which one would you choose and why? Here's the problem I have with that question. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, the Tudor era is really best looked at through a bit of a distance. They, <laughs> <laughs> they all died pretty bad deaths. <laughs> <laughs> they, all, um, they all had their issues. I am very curious as to um, a lot of the things that happen, but in terms of actually being one of the tutors, you have to be really careful. You, you need to know, uh, I'm a very cautious person, and you need to know the time machine is not going to get broken before you can get back. <laughs> you, you really don't want to be there. <laughs> If you both stayed, you're welcome. <laughs> you know, a lot of people want to know, oh, what was it like to be Anne Boleyn? It's like, oh, no, get me out of here. You, you definitely want to get out of there in time. Dangerous. It was a dangerous time. It was a dangerous time. We it, romanticized it. Uh, I mean, even a cold was a dangerous thing. You and know? Any, yeah, anything could, could kill you. Very, yeah. yeah. A so, lot of things. Not just anything, everything. Everything. Kill you. <laughs> it's surprising that some of them lived so long. Uh, yes, it is. Hmm. I want to go back to what I said at the very beginning. If you want to, if you're drawn to the Tudor era, if you are drawn to writing, um, go for it. I am so happy that I went ahead. I had, or I thought I had a book in me for literally 20 years. And I finally just sat down and wrote it. And um, it, it's been an incredible ride since then. Um, oh, oh, you know what? Here's, here's something to think about. And if you really want to write, and you can't bring yourself to write that book, try to think of an even bigger goal. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but um, my kids took karate for years and years. And one of the things you have to do when you're testing for your belt is to break boards. And when you're trying to break a board, the trick is not to aim at the board, but to aim beyond it. 
So if you can't bring yourself to write the book that you want to write, figure out that that's what happened with me and my Seymour saga. I was, you know, working on Jane the Queen, working on Jane the Queen. It wasn't really getting all that far. And then when I realized that it was part of a larger trilogy and I had a much bigger target, then all of a sudden it became much easier to write the book. So if you're really having a hard time pushing through, counterintuitive, make the target bigger and, and try that. I love that. That is, <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is awesome because you're right. People just think the book not beyond all of it. And you are available everywhere. You are on Facebook. You have a Facebook page. You're on Twitter. Um, TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> you're on TikTok. I think Instagram. you're everywhere. Instagram. So, and all those links are available on your website, right? Yes. Okay. Which will be in the link below. So, Please leave a comment. You can leave a comment for me. You can leave a comment for Janet or, you know, hit her up on social media, follow her on social media. You are writing how many more books right now? Uh, right now, three, my Elizabeth trilogy, Regina. And um, I might move over to France, same era, um, but just different country for the next trilogy. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm already planning. <laughs> That's good. That's I'm, good. I'm going through the board. Exactly. I think the more you write, as you said, the more the ideas come and the more you start and the more you've got, I need to write this and then this. And it just, it's a snowball. It's a snowball effect. Yes. You just have to start. You just have to start. And I have a video on that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would. Right. <laughs> Thank you so very much for joining me today and taking time out of your busy Sunday for this. I really appreciate it. And you. um, you're awesome. So are you. I appreciate being here. I appreciate you having me. Um, talking about writing and talking about tutors are my two favorite things to do. And talking about the two of them together, there, there's nothing better. <laughs> if you want to leave me or Janet a comment, just put it in the description box below. I'll have her website in there, which will have all her social media links. And if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and join our writing community. And thank you, Janet, so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. And as always, writers, remember to dream, even if it's in tutor time. <laughs> Create in tutor time and embrace. Bye-bye.